Hello, everybody. A warm welcome from me to you, and uh, great thanks to uh, Mr. Carlos, who is not here now, but he did, they really, and all the board of the conference, who did a really great conference to us. And yes, I'm happy that you're here to listen to my speech. Um, the name is The Management of Learning, Implications from Needs and Emotions for the Future of Learning. And I have to thank Anastasis because he helped me to find the introduction for my speech. <laughs> you know, on Wednesday in, in the afternoon, I think it has been about 5 o'clock, 5.30, there have been two hours of speeches before, and everybody wondering, but getting a little bit tired. I could see some people with their feet under the, and he said, please stand up, just relax a little bit, breathe and look. And that was a really good thing. Everybody was so happy and thankful for you. And uh, yeah, so this brings me uh, to, to my topic that emotions and needs play an important role, or maybe play an important role during learning situations, and so that we don't get into situations like this. No, this is not what we want. Um, I have to tell you, this is our German parliament. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> yeah, a, group, a group of students listening to our parliament. Okay, um, I give you a short presentation outlines. At the beginning, I want to talk a little bit about some ideas of learning. My a little bit theoretical background and thinking what I, how I think learning is working. And then, um, because I will talk in this uh, speech uh, a lot about digitalization and how we can use, uh, how learning will change in this digital world. I want to show you, maybe some of you know it, uh, maybe some not, uh, the principles of connectivism. It's a new theory of learning. Um, some of them looking very critical on it because they say it's not really a theory, it's more a concept but it shows us some new ideas of how we can work and collaborate together and how learning can function in uh, a digital world. Yeah, then I give you some ideas of learning in the digital world. And yeah, the question is what has this all to do with emotions and needs? So I will present this, show you, some of you who have been in the first lecture of me We'll see it again, but do a little bit another, show a little other bit things of the Felix app, which I use for evaluation in lifetime during courses. Uh, because my critic is that most of evaluation is at the end, after 13 weeks of semesters, and then come in, in Germany. Maybe here, it's different here? Yeah? Okay, yeah. We do evaluation only, at, mostly at the end, after 13 weeks, and we have 13 weeks of, we have half time a year, two. It's different here in the United States, maybe. Yeah. Okay, and some implications from this for the management of learning in the future. Yeah, I, I start with this uh, picture, the, the black box, because I think this is, um, yeah, it gives you an important hint why, why it's so complicated to know what's happening and how we are learning, yeah? We know a lot as teachers what we put in, for example, the content, the videos, the way we are presenting it, our methods play an important role, but then they come into your mind, or into your body, and we don't know what's happening. And sometimes we see what's coming out but what we see is mostly only the results of tests. Yeah? We see, okay, student did a good performance, or not so good performance, a medium performance, but we don't know if, for example, that what we show them is important for themselves, if it's uh, for their personal development. Yeah? Does it play, 
play, play a role. And I think um, the problem is for a lot of things that we really don't know when the learning happens. There are some scientists who try to find it out. I heard about someone who was tried to look into the faces of the students when the learning effect raises up. He thought something like, yeah, so now I got this idea and understandness. But in my opinion, learning can be a really long-term running. Yeah? It can be that students can be in your courses, and two years later they come into practice and see, hey, there was something, and I remember, and I have to look back again. So it's not like we give it in and the learning is coming out. And this is, uh, for me, very important to know when we're talking about learning. So my ideas about learning are, for example, once based on the ideas of Dewey and Piaget. I'm really a fan of experienced learning. Yeah? I think we need the experiences by ourselves. We need the reflection and to see uh, what still is going on. And in this part, it's very important to make mistakes. I think, you know, we only can learn when we're making mistakes. When we're not making mistakes, we are not in a learning process. Yeah? For example, if you want to become a very good soccer player, yeah, you will make a lot of mistakes, but for example, as a defender, or when you try to shoot, and you do it again and again and again. And by doing it, you're learning. Yeah? So, but in, in the university, very often, mistakes, or in school, are punished. Yeah? If you're making mistakes, you get bad marks. It's not said, yeah, it's good to make a mistake, because now I know where you can go on, what is important for you for working. Then, this is my perspective, learning is process-orientated. When we learn, we go through different obstacles, we are in different moods, we, we have some problems, some ideas, and it's really a process which happens and which is hard to observe. For this, I also developed a concept I call process-orientated didactics. And a third one, in my eye, it's system oriented And in this point, for me, the most important is that learning is something which is happening in ourselves, in, in the system, or when we look at the social system, in a group, yeah? like a system. And here, the, the point from Luhmann, his autopoiesis, so that it's really only in the system happening, is important. And this brings me to the point that learning belongs to intrinsic motivation. Yeah? We need to be, it's good to be motivated by ourselves. We try to do it also extrinsic, and this is also an important part, but for me, the best is when the students are motivated by themselves. They're interested in it. They want to learn something, and they want to develop. And the last one that I say, that emotions and needs always play in this process an important role. Yeah? Bad, bad emo or negative emotions can create something like hopelessness, that we don't go on anymore, uh, we don't believe that we can succeed, and like uh, joy or good emotions can help us to be motivated in the learning context. Okay. So now I come to the idea of connectivism. I think, yes, I forgot one, no, yes, this is, this is the principle that a system only can learn in, in itself, it's not, you never can from outside uh, give, uh, yeah, that's, I come later on, that's like, I teach you something and that now, because I teach, you will learn. No, no. It's just your way, the system, your function, your way of learning and developing. It's in the system. So when you say that by learning, you the system or the system? Hmm? Yeah, the system oriented. Uh, system, system, uh, from the system, systematic theory. I don't know, maybe I translated it wrong. Uh, 
Systemtheorie vom Rahab. Ja, yeah, System Theory. Ja, yeah, this is what I mean with System Orientated. Like, like Maturana and Luhmann, that, that systems are just, have their own processes and ways of developing and learning. And you can't do it from the outside perspective. No, not intrinsic, extrinsic. It's just belonging to the system. For example, a social system after human, the, uh, after lumen, is only communicating. And it's reproducing communication. And the system is nothing doing else than communication. Yeah? And then you have different systems, for example, a school or a teaching group or the political system. And it's always working by himself, principle, inside the system. Maybe we can talk later. <laughs> okay. So for short, for connectivism, here's some ideas. It's from Siemens. The name of this guy is Siemens. And, and he developed the idea that there must be something outside our learning theories we know, like the cognitivism or the behaviorism. He said learning can be outside our persons. It can be because we are getting connected. Yeah? And so he says, learning and knowledge rests in diversity of opinions, and learning is a process of connecting specialized nodes or information sources. So this is really belonging to our digital world, this idea. And which, which is important is that he says, capacity to know more is more critical than what is currently known. Yeah? So you really, in, in his theory, you have, where do I get the information? How can I combine information? Who helps me to create new ideas? And in this way, um, decision-making itself yeah, is a learning process. By choosing what to learn and the meaning of incoming information is seen through the lens of shifting reality. If we follow, I think, in the future more these kind of ideas, we will create other ways of learning environments. Yeah? It's not, I come to it later, more that we say we have a clear plan that the student has to follow. No, because the learning is coming to being, through being connected to others and to create new things and to bring it back. And here it says also the ability to see connections between fields, ideas, and concepts as a scored skill. Yeah, I think this is really something like systematic thinking, process thinking, and that you're looking for everything in the whole. So in his idea, autonomy plays an important role, openness, interactivity, um, I came up to this theory because students of mine developed uh, a course uh, through this idea of connectivism, where uh, students had, uh, the, the students in school had to find solutions for the other group and share it with the group and then look for others who help them and then come back and see if they are happy with these solutions or if they need some more. And so they're getting more and more connected and developing their own uh, solutions and ideas. So to end up uh, at the beginning with the first thing for me, teaching is not learning. I mean, it's hard for us because we want to be the best teachers and we think when they are the best learners, then we are the best teachers. But when you follow these ideas, teaching is not really learning. That's a two different things we have to think about. And now we come more to, to the uh, digital age. And here we see that the thinking in the industrial age was more linear. Yeah? And it was dichotomous. You had more the either or, yeah? or right or wrong. Yeah, there's only right or wrong. I still see this very often in school, and it made me upset when I see teachers who teach only right or wrong, and not, this is a possibility, and this may be also a possibility. You can think it that way, or you can look at the other way, and you get different solutions, 
and different ideas. So today, thinking in a digital age, this is very different from this. Uh, we are reticulated, re multicausal, and interactive. And it's more as well as and neither. And it's more belonging to the personal meaning. And for us as teachers, when we follow these ideas, um, we are more learner oriented yeah? and project oriented and not focused on the teacher who knows everything. But when we are looking at our curriculum, it's not so easy. How shall we change maybe our curriculum to these uh, demands and efforts here uh, for the future? Because we say we have some general information which should be taught to the students. And in a way, it's important too. So how can we combine it? This is a question where we have to work on, maybe by getting connected together. <laughs> that we have to think about, because it's difficult. I have, I have not the really solutions for that. Yeah, and um, the learners, definitely the subject of learning, and not the teachers. I think this idea is not so new. We have it in a digital age, but also, for example, Gibbs, he said it in the 90s, and a lot of teachers, these learner orientation or from the reform pedagogies. Um, but today it's getting more and more important. When we are using a digital, two ways of digital learning, then the first one is that we use digital media only more than as tools. Yeah? For example, we give the students an iPad and say you can use it in classes. Or they can use their handy or, or WhatsApp. But the Rosa uh, says the, the, the other way is that we need a new understanding of learning. Yeah? How people are getting connected with these others and how we can integrate these tools into a new way of learning. And I think it is more long-term and process oriented learning by maybe changing our habits and culture. Um, I was talking to, uh, um, uh, to a lady on, on, on Wednesday, and he, he's doing experiments with um, how, how computers can learn by the behavior of the people. Old people, for example, when they're getting older, their sleeping behavior and they have neuronal networks, and they learn if their behavior is normal or unnormal. And when it's unnormal, it changes, but it has to learn this. And it's the same problem we have uh, in, with the black box. They have it in these neuronal networks, yeah? Because they know what they put in, and they know what's coming out, but they don't know how the neurons <laughs> coming to the right results, yeah? And so here, that will be really creating a new future. And we have to think which, which tools can students use and how can they be helpful for them in their learning process. What we in the future have to learn by ourselves, for example, mathematics, or where we can have robots or whatever uh, beside us who helps us. So, uh, e-learning first 0.1 was more an island in the internet with different content yeah? and, and tools. In the future, um, the learners are configuring their learning environment. Yeah? And they start to use and create their own environment how to learn. I don't know how many of you are using Moodle. You have these? Yeah? Yeah. Moodle is belonging to the learning 1.0. And learning platforms in the future, they are much more flexible. And the, they are not like the teacher is here and the student is here. They are both more on the same level. They make the decisions together. So when, but when we look today into classes, this is our university. Uh, it's a really uh, a good room, new room. But this is typical lecture. Yeah, and uh, the scientists um, and they made some research. And what kind? What is typical still for lectures at the university? When they did it, it's longer a year ago, but I didn't 
from 2011, I didn't find a really new research. They said teacher-centered is still the most known. And it's not very varied, it's not very creative, and it's not very student-centered. But on the other side, I have to say that we have at our university, and I think also at the other universities, there are a lot of workshops for teachers, how to use e-learning, how to use new ways of teaching, integrating it. So I think it's starting a change now. We have these MOOCs, we have flipped classrooms starting up, we have collaborative possibilities, uh, teachers using WhatsApp with their students. Yeah, we can discuss about it, is this a good or bad, the students have different opportunities, but it's, 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 it's changing. It's really, I think it's changing, but we still have the problem from the curriculum in the big courses with the, no, with the standard content for we want to teach them, we use this. How will this be changed in the future? So, I think that the future of learning will be more individual, yeah, and that we give the students more the possibilities to choose their own rhythm when they want to learn. Maybe we have also to think about new ways of constructing conferences like this, yeah, that we are not the whole day hard, more, how can we make it a little bit more different, need orientated, more need orientated. You have no time duration and restrictions. Uh, some of our lectures, they are filming their lectures and the students can watch it whenever they like. They have the problem that there are not so many in the classes anymore. So this is the negative side of it. It's getting more and more collaborative. And uh, you have an openness. And what is now starting a lot in mathematics, for example, is the trend of using big data. Because when the students are working, learning mathematics and on online courses, they, they can see when they stop or where they have the problem. And from out of this, they can develop new ideas how to help them by learning. Yeah, what has this all to do with uh, emotions and needs, this digital and online uh, world? As I said before, learning is always an emotional and need-orientated process. I, I, I can see it with my students. For example, they're using WhatsApp groups. And then the first problem is coming up and they got really into trouble. And they're angry with each other because they have, don't find solutions and they use it by WhatsApp. And I said, stop, come, we have to <laughs> talk to each other. Yeah, so the digital world in some way produces emotions which can't be easily solved in a, in a way. So often the cognitive and emotional side is separated. In, in my way of thinking, there's always a duality of emotions and cognitions. It's, it's all belonging to each other. We really don't know what is first or what comes next. It's coming up. We have our thoughts and we have our emotions, and what is first and what is last is very difficult to answer, and it's a long history psychology discussion about this. Um, okay. So I want to show you some of my results from the Felix app. We invented, um, I invented an app which the idea is to look for the emotion and needs which occur coming up during classes. Yeah? So because I say when students are in a bad mood or they have needs, they can't learn in this situation, so I have to change something. And for this, I have the app where they can in real time just put in, I ask them some questions about how do you feel, what do you need, um, is everything fine for you, how are motivated you are, and then I present them the results and we are starting a discussion about it. For this, for example, I started, uh, I started to do some more breaks or to, at the beginning of my classes, I start to ask them if they have problems, if there is something going on before I start class. Normally we go in, we start class, we think the students are fine. No, maybe they have a question to the uh, 
to the lecture of the last time, maybe they have a problem with their group, maybe, 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 there are a lot of things. So here I show you some results um, from an explorative test of four students. Here you can see four, two students where we looked over the whole semester to different time points how they felt and how activated they are. And you can see that they have really, here's Cody, she's male and 27, they have really different types of activation and, uh, and emotions and, and the different time points. And this is, for example, which is good seen. And when the students are bored, they are not activated. And in my opinion, when you're bored, it's difficult to learn. I mean, there are some new results that boredom creating creativity. But when we are making a lecture, we don't want creativity. We want them to listen to our, <laughs> to our important theories and concepts and models. So, um, so it's really going up and down. And they have a lot of different emotions and kind of activation going with it. And you see, mostly when they are happy, they are higher activated. They also can be low activated for happiness when they are just fine, maybe. They and these things have been looking during the courses and here during days, days off. And we also, which I don't show you, uh, three more minutes. Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> so here, um, here you see a result of my course. Um, ach so, wie komme ich da jetzt hin? This is the app. When, you, when they filled it out, you see directly the result. This is how do you feel at the moment. And this is over a whole course at the end of a semester. And so they did it several times, and it's accumulated yeah, together. And you can see that um, yeah, it's a curve like this, but it's going to the right side. Yeah? So it's, I felt safe with my course, and it was good, and the students. But the, you always have students who don't feel good. And you have some of them who really feel great. Yeah? And a lot is here in the middle. But yeah, seven was positive, and one was negative. And here you can see you see the needs. And what is interesting for us, we did it now in really a lot of different courses. Students have a lot of physiological needs during courses. They need to move, they need to feed, they need some things. Yeah? And I don't know what we shall do with it, but maybe in a digital world we can change more the concept of construction of our courses that they be, will become more need orientated. And uh, this is everything was fine. And these uh, three are the social needs, social connection, communication, and A2 is the self-realization, self-orientated needs. So what does this mean to come to an end for the future of learning? Um, I think that the management of learning, we should give our students open and challenging working tasks. This is very important. Um, we should be more process oriented and not so on the output. Look more when we give them these challenges and tasks. Where are you now at the moment? Which problems do you have? Which way of solution you try to find? And what do you need? We have to give them more individual support if they have more possibilities to work on their own uh, ideas. And, which is not so easy for everybody of us, we have to become very familiar with the digital world. We have to know, we have to learn about the different learning tools and options and how to bring them together in a way which is effective for learning. This is not very easy. So the teacher in the future should be familiar with the digital world. He 
shall be a creator for open learning environment. He must be an expert in communication, in digital and analog in both ways. And he has to deal with different personalities, emotions, needs, and capabilities. And it would be good if he's flexible and open for different ways. So a lot for us <laughs> to do, a lot for us to learn in the future of learning. Yeah. So here with this, I come to, a, to an end. Yeah, yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Yes? Have you compared the results of your experience or were you using the test? Yes. Other professors who are not using the app? Like, are your students performing better? Yes. Yes, this is a very important point. You, 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 you say um, at the beginning we just try to find out more on a descriptive way what emotions and needs occur coming up during the courses. And uh, now, when we are looking for a need orientation, I have to do this, and I want to do it, that I integrate the app into the courses and do it another don't do it and see if motivation and need orientation is getting better. Till now, I only uh, asked the students after the courses some questions to, to know about it. And they said, yeah, your course have been very need orientated and it was good for us. And uh, we don't, for example, uh, I start at the beginning at every lesson to talk about what we did last week. Yeah? So these are things, they, they need orientated because they, they forgot. And so they get it back again and again into their, their minds. But it's a good thing and I want to do it and when I come back I tell you <laughs> the results. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. We just we just asked him how activated are you emotional, how activated are you social and cognitive. We do, we asked the question. It's just one question in this way. So yes, you can. It can be a little bit problematic because it's only one question for the activation. But this is the idea of the app to say, okay, we lose a little bit of uh, validity by taking less questions, but we are more in the real situation, and for this we get another point of view. Yeah? So it's a good question you asked. Yeah, yeah, maybe. No, it's it's yeah. No, it's it's like uh, I'm really here now, thinking and belonging to the course, and this this we are. Awesome. Yeah, on task. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's a very good point. When I when I started teaching. Uh, I was really goal orientated, yeah, and I thought I have to give them clear goals, clear presentation, clear structure, and then my courses become better. And and I and but the experiences I made that when I start to get in contact with my students and ask them, there was such a big variety and. There are so many problems came up, and often I tried to be really good, but I could see, no, the students don't understand what I do, or they have problems with my ways of teaching. So I start to develop this way of process-orientated thinking, and I came to the point, oh, learning obstacles play an important role. The students have, on a psychological and also on a uh, cognitive way, problems during the learning process. And if I don't take care about it, I can't change. And so I went on and on and then I said, oh, emotions play an important role and I have to find a way how I can integrate it more into my courses. And now I'm at a point I have to say, it's, I'm still trying out and testing it and how can I use it and uh, 
we want to work on with skin conductance and other physiological uh, parameters. So uh, I'm always in a development process. And this is my idea of teaching and learning, that teachers are learners. And we should learn by teaching. Yeah? And develop ourselves in this way. And this is a try, what I try to do. And I make a lot of mistakes during this process. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.